An inquiry into the death of Lagos chef Pedro Uboma is taking place or has taken place after her family accused the medical center that treated her of negligence. But here to speak more on this actually is the executive vice chairman and chief executive of the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, who you saw earlier, who was here about a month ago, Babatunde. Uru Kera. Thank you so much for joining us. And also joining us on this interview is our correspondent, Shaitan Atigari, who's been covering the inquiry so far. Shaitan, welcome to the show as well. Thank you, Adesawa. Well. Uh, just to begin, uh, Mr. Babatunde, yesterday we had Dr. Atilola, who basically said your commission was dabbling into a territory which wasn't is. Uh, so clarify that. What do you have to say to the likes of Dr. Tilola, who says your commission shouldn't be holding this inquiry in the first place? Well, I mean, my sense of that is uh, I respectfully disagree. Um, and uh, it's not new. Uh, the FCCPC is an overall consumer protection and competition regulator. We do not issue any licenses to anyone. And so we are not primarily um, licensors or holders of any powers over sectors. And so it's typical. However, our only constituency is the consumer. And so we represent consumers, whether of any goods or any services. The law is abundantly clear. Section 2 of the FCCPA says if you engage in any commercial activity at all in Nigeria, you are subject to the FCCPA. It even goes on to say if your services are geared towards a public demand, you're subject to the FCCPA. And when I listened to him, and somebody sent me a clip, it was very ingeniously uh, relied on Section 17, subsection P of the FCCPA, where he says that uh, the FCCPC will encourage professional associations to self-regulate, uh, develop into standards. But what he also uh, didn't mention are multiple provisions of the same law that says we would enforce compliance with applicable standards. And the FCCPC only looks out to ensure that where a consumer is injured, there is some kind of retribution. It's their redress mechanism. The MDCN, like many other uh, professional disciplinary authorities, is an internal uh, mechanism within the profession to hold professionals accountable to themselves. And what a consumer uh, protection regulator does is, is to hold service providers accountable to the people they provide the, the services to. Completely different things. Uh, investigation has absolutely nothing to do with disciplining any doctor. As a matter of fact, if you haven't complied with applicable standards, you're dead on arrival. We don't even have anything to say to you. But it is possible that you comply with applicable standards, even global standards, and injury still occurs. In those circumstances, the FCCPC will get engaged. It doesn't matter what the service is, whether it's legal service, accounting service, or certainly medical service, telephone service, or any type of service, we will get involved. And the inquiry was not about individual doctors. It wasn't about what anybody did, and there's no way any remedy would have provided, would have resulted in a loss of license. It's purely about injury to a consumer, in this case, um, Mrs. Ugoma and her family. And if anyone should take responsibility for that, regardless of who they are, we would pursue it. Uh, the Medical and Dental Council, you should ask, what's their remit with respect to redress mechanisms? What is the potential penalty you would suffer if something went wrong? Expulsion? Okay. Suspension? Being struck off the register? What does that do to an injured consumer? Okay, Mr. Irukera, let me come in at this point. I mean, even listening to you, it's clear that there's a conflation of issues, even as you speak. You mentioned that unless there's injury, your, your focus is to address the issue of injury and who should be accountable for that. But I remember when you were here uh, last time, you mentioned that with regards to medical cases, injury does not automatically redound to a remedy. Absolutely. So, so in this instance, what would be the possible outcome of the public hearing you held? Since ultimately, who will you hold accountable for an injury that could have been a natural occurrence of having done the right thing, in spite of having done the right thing? Fantastic. That's a great question. Doing the right thing doesn't mean that there's no liability. That's the law. 
I mean, it doesn't matter that you perform to the appropriate professional standards. If injury occurs on account of your conduct, you'll be held accountable for the injury. Now, if you didn't perform up to your appropriate ethical standards, then your disciplinary regulator will hold you accountable for your conduct. And so, for instance, what, we, what that hearing was about, for one, it was one, we questioned the billing supervisor for Premier. And obviously something that the family alleged was that there was a lack of clarity with respect to the billing and they do not think that they were fairly billed. They do not think they got value for the services they paid for. That's one thing that comes out of our inquiry. And secondly, you had an expert doctor whose role right now is assisting a state in the United States with respect to process review, utilization issues. And so sometimes it's even possible that in providing a service, you overbill. And he gave an example of if you're supposed to be hospitalized for two days, for a certain thing, and you're hospitalized for 10 days, and the bill is running. And so he was reviewing the process and the utilization, and part of what comes out of that is, in this value chain, what could have gone wrong? What could have been done differently? Part of his testimony was, all right, should this person have been in the ICU earlier? Was there a need for ICU monitoring at all? Were there tests that should have been repeated? Were there things that should have been pointed out earlier? I remember questioning uh, Mr. Uboma, did you know that your wife was diagnosed with an acute renal uh, kidney injury? No. Did you know that there was potentially uh, um, uh, a transfusion problem when um, in surgery? No, he didn't. Did he know that uh, she was suffering from hypotension? No, he didn't. Did he know that there was hypovolemia? No, he didn't. And, and, and the patient's bill of rights is abundantly clear. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the peculiarities and the processes, uh, the maintenance of the quality control, especially in the medical sector. When we spoke to uh, Dr. Atilola yesterday, he did say that there is a provision in the Medical Code of Ethics that stops medical uh, doctors from divulging information about the treatments, the ailments, and under their care. Now, if we look at the fact that, you know, they had been there and then were called away by the Medical and Dental Council uh, Association of, of Nigeria because they were not supposed to testify, and the fact that they had eventually sent in their records to be looked at by this expert uh, from Cook County in Illinois, can you, can, can you help me understand that? How does that affect your case? If you can't speak to, directly to the doctors that were involved, you know, in the operations and the treatment of uh, uh, Peju Uboma, how does that affect your investigation? Quite frankly, I think the opportunity to testify was uh, far more in the interest of the doctors than it is um, the regulator or even the Uboma family. The reason is the law empowers us to seek those documents. We have them. We got our medical records. Um, we've analyzed them to the extent that we have the expertise. And in the areas where we don't have the expertise, we've gotten someone to analyze them. The law also allows us to make decisions based on the materials that we have reviewed. The law allows us to make decisions when a particular party fails to provide information to the best uh, of our request. And so he would, the, the, the doctors that treated Mrs. Uboma would have been in a better situation now if they had been able to explain some of the things that they, they, they did in this process. And so uh, with respect to the question of confidentiality that Dr. Atilola raised, now confidentiality is not an absolute thing. It's, 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 the, it's the subject's power or right to waive and um, Mr. Obama had waived confidentiality. He had waived it. And secondly, like I said during the hearing, there are exceptions to confidentiality. One of the exceptions is that pursuant to operation of law, if the law demands that you provide information, you provide the information. Another exception to confidentiality, even for doctors, is to defend themselves. Mm. If, if, if this was in a court of law, and Mr. Obuma had gone there to make all kinds of allegations, and those allegations were not substantiated, what would these doctors do? Would come to the court and be quiet? Those allegations, now they need to defend themselves, and the allegations against them are a waiver. As a matter of fact, many times if you're under a health management organization, one of the things you sign off 
as part of your uh, contract is a waiver for your medical records. And so all the waivers were in place. And these doctors know that. So there's absolute, there was absolutely no ethical obligation. And it was abundantly clear that this wasn't a disciplinary procedure. Oh. It had nothing to do with discipline. And if you look at what happened, there was no way. Nobody identified any doctor by name to find out what he did or didn't do. The MDCN has a register of doctors. It doesn't have a register of hospitals. It doesn't have a register of facilities. Okay. One of the things you might remember is that cancer to Premier specifically said, I thought you invited Premier here and doctors to speak in their role in Premier. And so that's clear that there was no dilemma about what they were there for. And sorry if I might say, the example Dr. Atilola gave about how the MDCN proceeds exactly underscores the issue. And he used an air crash example. Fantastic. In the US, the NTSB investigates air accidents. In Nigeria, the Accident and Investigation Bureau, the AIB. What Dr. Atilola didn't tell you is that the AIB doesn't license pilots. The Civil Aviation Authority licenses pilots. The, as a matter of fact, the AIB is independent to make sure that someone else is looking at that conduct. Okay. What he also didn't say is that there are all kinds of other uh, agencies, including the FCCPC in aviation. Martin, like I said, even Dr. Right. Sanusi. Mr. Mr. Urukara, it seems like a lot of issues and also jurisdiction clash who has powers over what. And so let me ask you, because last time you were on the show, you talked about collaboration. The uh, MedCAN, which is the disciplinary uh, body for doctors in Nigeria, was conspicuously absent at your two-day inquiry. What is the level of collaboration your commission has with MedCAN? And let me also ask you, in the, in the unfortunate case of death to a patient, I know you've spoken about this uh, previously, but for those who are yet to grasp it, is there a way to distinguish uh, between the consumer rights infraction and, of course, medical negligence? How do you distinguish both? Good. So I'll start from the back. The two are completely distinguishable. It's a question of what end of the candle you're coming from. I coming from the consumer angle, it doesn't matter to us whether someone violated any ethical or professional obligations. I mean, if, there was an, if, if there's a delay in a flight, I don't go around trying to find out if a pilot was drunk and that's why he came late to work. All I care about is that you were supposed to airlift a passenger at this time and you didn't. What are the reasons? All right, so weather, safety, fine. If it's not weather and safety, it is just, if it's just a, a lack of sensitivity or responsiveness, we hold you accountable. It doesn't matter to us whether the pilot had the excess number of hours or not. The same thing in medicine. We're not about to find out whether a doctor was sleeping at the wheel or whatever the case may be. Now, the facts, those same facts might be relevant. And so, for instance, if a, if a pilot was late to work in the course of your investigation of why a flight was delayed, it comes up. And so you can say this flight was delayed, and this is the reason. And so even if it came up to, to in, in our inquiry that a doctor failed certain ethical obligations, we'd refer that to the MDCN immediately. We would not attack, we, we have no remedies for that under our law. Now, with respect to whether we are collaborating with the MDCN, absolutely, absolutely, we're in communication with them. As a matter of fact, at the time we opened this investigation, we wrote the MDCN. We provided and clearly said the direction which our investigation will go. So we are collaborating with the MDCN. Why was the MDCN not there? We didn't invite the MDCN, and that is the right thing. We invited every other person. The only person who declined to participate on the panel was the NMA, and that's okay. We respect that. I mean, we had a similar investigation last year. The NMA participated. What has changed? The only thing that we see that has changed here is the subject of the investigation. Premier is the subject of the investigation. Premier is different from Arjolad. And so you can see that two hospitals approach the regulatory process in different ways. And so I don't understand what the issues really are. The MDCN should certainly not be at our investigation. As a litigator myself, if the MDCN was sitting on this panel, if for any reason, the MDCN decided to open an investigation, I would raise an issue of conflict. You sat on a panel that already made certain findings. 
You sat on a panel that I am possibly even challenging the outcome. Okay. How can you be fair enough to now investigate? Mr. Irukera, I'll, I'll have to come in here because we want to get as many questions in as possible. Thank sure. you for your clarification so far. But still piggybacking on my colleague's uh, this was question. You say you are collaborating, but on the face of it, I, I, I have to say it doesn't appear that way because the conversation we're having would be better had with the MDCN in a sense, since it seemed that they were pulling the, the, the rug from under the feet of the doctors. Had they been in collaboration with you, couldn't those issues have been clarified in advance? And because on the back of your investigations, we would, if you were in clear communication, your findings will, should prove useful to them ordinarily, but we're not sure on the face of, well, and, and, of the and, clash. And that's, and that's the point I was making. For instance, like every other investigation we've heard, the first thing we do is to communicate with the MDCN. And even when MDCN looks at issues, they send some things to us. We've seen many things where we think this is pure professional or ethical issues, and we send it to the MDCN. That's the record of our collaboration. And, 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 and the first I was hearing about any MDCN discomfort, with this investigation was on Tuesday, right there at the panel. That's the first I was hearing about it. MDCN's letter about um, clarifying certain issues came to me from multiple social media platforms before I saw it from, from the regulator. And so for me, I'm pretty clear in my mind that our relationship with the MDCN is fine. They knew about this investigation. The only thing that changed is that in the close hours to the investigation, a certain party, a target of the investigation, apparently got involved in what we consider the FCCPC in an inappropriate manner. And the MDCN would only work with information that it is provided. And I'm certain that we're going to end up sitting around the table and our relationship would still be exactly what it was, collaborative, cross-referral. And a point that Dr. Atilola made was that why not allow MDCN to proceed before we proceed? And in some cases, that will be right. In some other cases also, it will be right for us to proceed before MDCN proceeds. In some cases, MDCN will proceed without us proceeding. MDCN would find sometimes that doctors have acted inappropriately without it having created any injury to any consumer. All sometimes right. we will find that consumers have been injured without doctors having acted inappropriately. Okay, so very quickly, uh, before we wrap up, I just, we've spoken about Peju um, Boma's case extensively. I would just like to know uh, exactly where the FCCPC is on the case of uh, um, Omolara Omoya Joe. Good. So those were two cases we opened at approximately the same time, but the uh, investigations haven't progressed exactly the same way. And on that, I will commend Premier, com commend uh, Mr. Uboma, commend Evercare, because they have responded more timely and we have been able to put all the material together to progress the investigation. With respect to Mrs. Oya, Ms. Omoya Joe, the investigation is still developing, the materials are still coming in, and when that also crystallizes, we will proceed exactly the way we proceeded in this one. In 10 seconds, if you can, you have threatened to stretch to any length in ensuring that justice is done for these consumers, unfortunately, in this incident, dead. To what extent are you willing to go? Full extent. Absolutely what is full that? extent, including prosecution if necessary. Okay. Babachande Rukera, thank you so much for coming on Newsday once again. We'll definitely be following this story with you.